uh, Ronald Sandler and John Bassel. They're going to share the podium here. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I hope we're going to get into the issue of, oops, sorry, pardon me. My time's up already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're moving faster and faster. <laughs> Um, I hope they're going to get into the issue of how capacities are, are relevant to moral agency, but we'll see. Um, so uh, Ron is Associate Professor of Philosophy and the Director of the Ethics Institute at Northeastern. His research areas are environmental ethics and the intersections of uh, ethics and technology. And John, who will be part of this, will, is an Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Northeastern uh, whose work fo focuses on ethics, applied ethics, and the philosophy of biology. Thank you. Um, so as, as the title indicates, what we're going to be talking about today is um, we're going to be trying to mo we're going to be trying we're going to be trying to motivate the idea um, or propose the idea uh, that responsible development of robust AI would be promoted by implementing s some uh, AI research oversight committees, similar to the types of committees that are used in other types of research, like human subjects research or embryonic stem cell research. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how that might be structured, how the, the committees might be tasked, how they might be constituted, empowered, and so on. Now, my job <laughs> was to motivate this project, uh, and then John was going to talk, is going to talk about uh, the details of what the committees might be like. But in a lot of ways, the last two talks were just motivating the project. So thanks, Matt, um, <laughs> Eric, and Mara. I appreciate that. Um, because the one thing to, to recognize um, is if we think that, uh, uh, that artificial intelligences that have capacities uh, similar to humans are going to have the same moral status similar to humans, they're going to come from somewhere. There's going to be a process by which they come about. And so, uh, and there's going to be some features of that process that's going to make it, uh, that's going to require uh, some, some sensitivity to what's going on. So, for example, uh, as Eric pointed out, there's going to be epistemological issues. It's not going to be always obvious that these things are, these capacities are emerging uh, at a certain rate. Uh, another concern uh, is, um, or to take uh, Eric's point and Mara's point, look, if you have design principles that you could put into them if they are going to uh, be morally considerable such that um, you want to make sure that when they do arise, people are going to be able to recognize them, then you have to have some kind of enforcement mechanism to make sure that those design principles are followed. So we heard earlier today that um, one thing we could do uh, is we could... We could trust the AI researchers, uh, wherever they're working on it, that they're going to be benevolent, they're going to design these things in, and they're going to take precautions. Um, but there's lots of research, I'm um, sorry, there's lots of research that uh, involves possibly emergent moral status properties. Embryonic stem cells research is like this, and chimeric research where you're mix mixing genomic materials between humans and non-humans in the research. And in these kinds of cases, we do think that there has to be some kind of oversight mechanism, some kind of um, review process to make sure that, uh, that, that uh, if, if issues are arised, then they're recognized, and to make sure that, and this is to a question that came up earlier, uh, that maybe there's certain kinds of experiments that might actually not be OK, because the experiments themselves or the outcomes could be disrespectful of the moral status of, of the agents, so of, of the uh, the research subjects. So if, if, uh, if we think that it's possible that we're going to have entities that uh, during the course of research are going to have capacities that are going to uh, give them moral status and that those capacities are going to merge throughout this process they need to be recognized, then we're going to probably need some kind of institutional oversight mechanism to make sure that the research is sensitive to this and that researcher is designed in the appropriate uh, protocols and uh, mechanisms of recognizing when this occurs. Okay? Uh, so then the question just becomes, how do you do this? And in the other cases, we've seen that, um, that a committee mechanism is the best way to do it. And so that's the approach that John and I were thinking about uh, for this, and he's going to come up and talk about the details about how that might work. 
this one. I was told not to tap the mic. Can everyone hear? Uh, so thanks, Ron. Um, so if we assume that um, in the development of artificial intelligence, sometimes they'll have capacities which ground moral status, and so therefore we owe them consideration. Um, the question then, like Ron said, is how do we make sure that they're treated in a way that's appropriate, given that they have those capacities and have moral status? So, um, so the, what sort of oversight model should we use to ensure their protection? So. Um, research subject oversight when it comes to, so there are different kinds of oversight. We might care about oversight to protect us from AI, but when it comes to subject sensitive oversight, oversight that's designed to protect research subjects, we typically use what we call a committee based model. You have a group of people with the relevant kinds of expertise. Um, they're typically submitted some, pro some form of, of a protocol that describes the research that's going to be done. They have a set of questions they ask about that, and then via some mechanism they approve or disapprove the protocol. They have various different powers. Um, common versions of this are IRBs, institutional review boards. Um, anybody who's had to deal with those, they're the bane of your existence, I'm sorry. Um, and the same is true for people who do animal research. That's We have a couple of IACUCs, Animal Care and Use Committees. Um, so this is a standard model, and there are reasons that it's the standard model, and there are good reasons why it would be a good model in the case of artificial intelligence research. Um, it, there's a certain set of advantages it has with the alternative. The alternative kind of model would be what we might call a compliance model. You have a set of rules, you have compliance officers, they make sure the researchers are following the rules. Um, but this is actually not a really good model for AI research for several reasons. One is tied up with different forms of epistemic uncertainty when it comes to which capacities these things are going to have um, and how they're likely to develop. I'm going to get into those a little later. But also because there are just many different forms that AI research takes. You might have, there's the machine learning group and there might be the brain simulation group. And so you might think that it's hard to design a single set of rules that's gonna be useful in governing all these different modes of research. Uh, and also the technology advances rapidly. So you have this worry about lag that if you set a set of rules, researchers are gonna be slowed down by having to comply with them and having to get them changed when it's time to sort of consider new ways of building AI. So the committee-based model is more nimble, it's more adaptable, it's less likely to slow down research, while still being responsible to the ethical challenges raised by um, giving rise to morally salient capacities. So how do we, uh, how do we develop and structure uh, robust AI research subjects oversight committees? And that's what I really wanna focus on. Um, here's sort of a schema for developing oversight committees. So. Uh, for subject sensitive oversight. So you identify some ethical aims. These are the important things we want a committee to accomplish. Then you identify a set of obstacles, things that are gonna prevent us from achieving those ethical aims, and then you constitute, task, and empower a committee to resolve those issues. So you say, here are the experts we need to resolve these obstacles. Um, here's the kinds of tasks we should assign them. We should gotta design protocols to figure out what kind of information we need to give them, figure out what kinds of questions they should ask, and then give them a bunch of power maybe not too much power, you have to negotiate these powers to see, to balance protecting research subjects when it's appropriate and not slowing down research too much. Um, and so I wanna model this, show you how this sort of schema works in a particular case. So I'm gonna talk you through how we can apply this schema to an existing case of animal welfare regulation. So animal, all uh, federally funded animal research in the United States is governed by the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and the way that, that um, is implemented is through these things called IACUCs, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And here's how sort of the IACUCs fit into the schema. So what is the ethical aim? So the ethical aim as laid out by the law is that uh, we have an obligation to minimize the suffering of vertebrate research subjects consistent with realizing legitimate research aims. So it's not that we can't cause animals to suffer, although maybe you think that's morally appropriate, that's not how our legal framework has it set up. The law requires that we minimize animal suffering consistent with achieving legitimate research aims. Um, so that's the ethical aim. Obstacles. Uh, there are some challenges related to questions of how will this protocol, this pr pr proposed design, cause suffering? What are the ways this animal can suffer? How are they likely to suffer given the way things are set up? Um, and this raises challenge that you need to answer by appealing to someone who can tell you what kinds of research subjects and what suffer in which ways. There are things like, so for example, um, different rodents suffer differently from different kinds of captivity. So I think, I think that uh, rats um, mind or are stressed by not being in group housing in ways that mice are not. Um, I, I might have it backwards. Um, and so you need to answer questions like that. Which of these research subjects is likely to suffer less? You need to answer questions about scientific legitimacy. Is, so 
not only are the animals going to suffer, but is this research worth causing animal suffering to achieve whatever the ends are? Um, that question is extremely hard to answer. Whenever I assign my students a sample research protocol, they almost never think the research is worth doing. You need an actual scientist to tell you why this little thing, why these 50 mice suffering, to answer this, in my case, it was always pigeons. I was on an eye cook for a while. There was always a researcher that wanted to know how pigeons located targets on the ground. And the first question you ask is, well, does this help us in any way? Is the pigeon brain anything like ours such that this would help us? And the answer is no. Um, but, but then the scientists would say, yeah, but here's how it contributes to this broader research project and explain to me why I should be okay with this um, and then point me to the fact that the NSF thought it was good enough, so I should think it's good <laughs> enough too. Um, so we have to be able to answer these research legitimacy con questions and put, these, put this research in broader context. And another set of challenges involves biases. Um, and I'm not saying that scientists are just going to pass anything through the IACUC. In my experience, scientists are very responsible members of IACUCs. But of course, they have a bias towards minimizing the suffer of animals. Lots hangs on getting research done. Lots of money is in the balance. Um, you have worries about quid pro quo schemes, about one scientist approving this because they might be a member on the IACUC, or they might be submitting a protocol next time when the IACUC has a different member, things like that. So how do you address these obstacles to achieve the ethical aim of minimizing suffering? Well. Uh, the way IACUCs are composed is they have at least three members covering these four categories, uh, a veterinarian, a scientist, a non-scientist, and a non-institutional member, someone that's not from the institution doing the research. Usually IACUCs are much bigger. They don't just have three members. There's not someone playing a dual role. Some institutions, University of Wisconsin, for example, has each college that does animal research has its own IACUC, and there's a campus-wide IACUC, and they're all, they have 15 to 20 people. Um, and, but you can see why those, that constitution will help you achieve overcoming those obstacles. You have someone that can, the veterinarian that can answer questions about how various members of different species suffer and under what context they'll suffer. You have scientists that can tell you about the worth of scientific research. And you have members of the public and people outside of the discipline to, to protect against bias towards or bias against animal welfare. Uh, and uh, so they're tasked with they're given a set of protocols. They have this expertise. They're tasked with assessing the protocol to make sure it achieves the ethical aim, helping each other to answer these questions from drawing on their different areas of expertise. Uh, and then they have the authority to approve the protocol or not. If not, it goes back to the researcher. They try again. Um, uh, monitoring life during the life of the protocol, the veterinarian will typically walk around the animal facilities, and they have the power to suspend the protocol. So there's some serious power to make sure that we're achieving the ethical aim. So now when we transition to the question of AI research subjects oversight, um, the question is, how can we sort of take this schema and apply it and try to develop AI research oversight to protect research subjects? Um, so let's just start with the ethical aims. Um, it, it'd be nice, it'd be really great if we could just draw on the ethical aims of IACUCs and say, hey, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to minimize the suffering consistent with achieving uh, legitimate research aims. But there's a problem with that. Um, we are not sure exactly what kinds of capacities AI research subjects are going to have. And if they have robust capacities like us, we heard from Matthew, um, and I, I think this is consistent with what Eric and Mara were saying, uh, we're going to owe them more. It's not appropriate to treat human research subjects in a way that minimizes their suffering consistent with achieving legitimate research aims. Uh, IRB protections are much stronger than IACUC protections. So we need something that's a little broader that's going to be protective of the many different kinds of individuals we could have given their different levels, I don't want to say levels, different types of moral status they might have. Um, so here's, sorry, here's one stab, oh, this is, there we go. Here's one stab at the, I think a plausible stab at what the ethical aims could be that would cover this, the variety of cases. Um, treat e each AI in a way that's commensurate with its moral status. If the, if the AI has cognitive capacities that are very similar to the cognitive capacities of dogs, we should treat it the way that it would be appropriate to treat a dog. Now we might, just adopt the IACUC standard and say what that means is minimizing the suffering of that animal consistent with research engine, or we might rethink what's commensurate treatment given the type of being it is. Um, if the AI ends up having human-like capacities, then we should apply a different standard. Um, and because we may develop things that have totally alien capacities to us, we're gonna have to think about what beings of that type that have this cluster of relevant morally salient capacities, what types of treatment are commensurate with that type of moral status or given those capacities. So that's, I think, the moral aim. Now the, 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 hard, the hard part, um, areas of difficulty. I've divided the areas of difficulty into three distinct parts. I'm not naive enough to think that I've covered them all. I'm not naive enough to think that these categories have uh, hard borders. Um, but they're sort of useful ways of thinking about these. So consciousness challenges. So one problem that appears here that appears, I think, less so in 
animal ethics research is the question about the bases of consciousness. Uh, Paul Bogosian likes to bring this up every third or fourth talk, and I've been really thankful for that. Um, we really don't have a good answer to this question, um, but it's, and, it, and that doesn't matter so much in the case of animals because they have behaviors and physiology um, and they're tied to us via evolutionary history so that we know that those behaviors and physiology are pretty good evidence that they have capacities like ours. If they have a similar brain part, <laughs> this is very naive science, they, if they have brains that are very similar to ours and they behave in ways that are similar to ours, we can expect that they evolve for similar purposes and so similar, have similar qualia. You might be skeptical of that, but our inferences about minds that are like ours and evolutionarily related to ours are better than our inferences about minds that are made of computer parts that don't share an evolutionary history and aren't physiologically like ours. At least that, you can try to talk me out of that. So that makes it important to figure out like what is the basis of consciousness because that would actually help us determine what capacities these things have. If you just, if you knew, if you're a naive behaviorist, this becomes very easy but also very ethically challenging, um, you can figure out, oh, this thing is satisfying these naive, naive behavioral rules, so therefore it's conscious, right? So we can answer, does it have these capacities by applying a behavioral test? If you have a different view about the basis, the conscious, bases of consciousness, you have to figure out whether it has those bases. But it might be one of the most tractable ways to answer which capacities does this AI have is answering this question. Uh, so that's important, but we also have a set of empirical questions related to this. We might ask, given that there's different mechanisms for developing artificial intelligence, which on different, um, on different, given different technologies, how likely are we to realize those bases of consciousness? So if you're using, um, let's say, I don't know, direct brain simulation, you might be, hey, if this works, we're pretty sure it's gonna have these bases of consciousness, so that tells us something about its morally relevant capacities. Um, if you use an evolutionary uh, algorithm, you may have no idea whether it satisfies the bases of consciousness. So, so you wanna know what's the probability of achieving various bases of consciousness given different kinds of ways of developing AI. So those are some challenges having to do with consciousness. Um, epistemological challenges, these, some of these are also related to consciousness, but we might be completely in the dark about the capacities of developed AI. Might be completely in the dark. So then let's say you, you do some research, you develop an AI and you wanna try to figure out whether it has moral status. We need a set of ways to test hypotheses about, for example, alien intelligences. How do we come to make these inferences? What kind of behavior should we look for? What kind of responses should we look for? So you need that. Um, and then there's a set of normative questions. One of those normative questions is, what is the commensurate treatment given these kinds of capacities? Like, given that this individual has these capacities, what's the appropriate way to treat it? So that's a straightforward normative question that we, we some moral philosophers will claim to have settled. I often claim to have settled some of them. but. We're gonna have to fight about that in the context of designing AI research oversight. But there's other normative questions, like um, given that we're not gonna answer the consciousness questions or the epistemological questions in a compelling way for everyone, um, how should we reason under disagreement and uncertainty? So the Future of Humanity Institute has a project where you, how do you reason under cases where you have serious chance of risk um, and high degrees of uncertainty? And you might think, well, you could be morally cautious, you don't wanna harm any moral agents, and then maybe you go the way that Eric Amar did. You just don't do research unless you can be really sure that it's gonna be, you're gonna be able to tell whether it's conscious. That will significantly slow down research, I suspect, so you might try to use some other normative principle for how to make decisions in uncertainty. Okay, um, so how do you address those obstacles? I just wanna talk a bit about constituting the uh, committee and then I'll be done. Um, we need experts from a wide variety of fields. Uh, so to address the consciousness problems, we need to talk to philosophers of mind, cognitive and neuroscience. I didn't put psychologists here, but they should totally be up here. Um, uh, but we're also gonna need computer scientists and engineers. They're gonna, gonna be the ones, so let's say the, the neuroscientists tell us, hey, if you get a system that's functionally like this, it's conscious. Um, we're gonna need computer scientists and engineers to tell us whether that's been physically realized in another system, right? Maybe the neuroscientists won't know. Um, to answer the epistemological questions, we're gonna need philosophers of science, epistemologists, but also I think we should draw on ethology and biology. People who are equipped to make, to try to go out and find a new species and try to guess what its cognitive, they don't guess, try to determine what its cognitive capacities are. Um, so we wanna draw on them because they're good at designing these kinds of inferences. And then for the normative questions, we're gonna need um, ethicists, decision theorists. So it's a broad range of expertise. And that itself, I think, raises some serious challenges. First of all, there are just obstacles to interdisciplinarity that Wendell Wallach was talking about before. We, we talk a lot about wanting to be interdisciplinary, but we're not. But a more serious problem is that there's not, there are not that many places in the world that have that kind of diversity of expertise. 
And so you could worry about this concentration of research or, or like if you put these rules in place that you have to be committee approved to do this research, you could worry about a concentration of intellectual resources and certain people being excluded from engaging in these research projects. Um, so to address that, you have to consider things that we don't do with other committees, which is decentralized and distributed committees. Maybe the right model is to have, there's a place where these committees are formed and they draw on expertise from lots of different institutions and then institutions themselves send their protocols to these committees and get feedback from them instead of having it the way it is now with typical committees, which is every institution has their own. Um, and there are some remaining challenges. First of all, funding. You need to, there are gonna be administrative costs to this. There are gonna be costs to continuing to develop, develop think about what should be in a research protocol. Um, there are gonna be challenges with tasking and empowering. How do you, I've only, I've only hinted at how you solve one of the problems, who should be on the committees, not what their job should be and uh, what authority they should have. That's gonna have to be negotiated with AI researchers who are gonna maybe not like this. Um, probably not gonna like this. If they listen to their, the people who have to deal with IA cooks and IRBs, they're definitely not gonna like it. Uh, and then we, so, that, the, so then we have this other problem that we have to secure individual buy-in, not just from researchers that are doing the work, but from people that are willing to, that's a lot of work to review these protocols, um, but also from institutions and corporates, you gotta get them to buy in, see that this is important, or else uh, coerce them in some way. Um, uh, so those are remaining challenges, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering how we figure out what systems fall under the scope of these committees. I mean, the committees themselves, in all the in human and animal cases, have some subtle distinctions, decisions to make. But we um, have pretty straightforward rules for figuring out which systems fall under the scope. I mean, in one case, humans. In the other case, you said, okay, vertebrate animals. Okay, it's a bit arbitrary, but at least it's a, uh, it's a line. It's very hard to see what a comparable line or criterion is gonna be for what systems fall under the scope of an AI research subjects committee. Is it every AI system? I mean, there is this, I don't know if you've seen the website out there, people for the ethical treatment of reinforcement learners. <laughs> <laughs> every time you give that negative reward signal, there's a bit of, there could be a bit of suffering going on. And some ones, at least, some ethicists have to be, uh, looking into this, and even if you're skeptical about this, it's very unclear there's gonna be any bright line anywhere to be drawn, so do you have ideas about how to? I, I thought about this a little bit, so a couple things to say. First, on the IACUC boxes, there's the, the first box on a protocol says, does this experiment cause more than momentary pain or distress to the research subject? If the box is no, then someone from the IACUC can just be assigned to look at the protocol and pass it off without it going through a whole committee. So you could have something like that. It's still not, it's still not gonna do the narrowing you need because you're thinking there's gonna be tons of these research programs which are AI research programs. Um, so what do you do about that? I think the answer is, um, well, I'm willing to say this. I'm happy to leave it up to the AI researchers because they're the ones that oftentimes in their funding make these promises about how robust their machine learning capabilities are gonna be. And so I'm, I'm okay with, hey, if we fund it and it's part of the research thing that they think that it's gonna realize robust cognitive capacities, then, then we should evaluate that. But if they admit in their thing, like we're just doing this, we're just doing reinforcement learning, we're not doing anything different, we're using traditional computational components, then it doesn't go through review. So. Well, I think we make a judgment. We come up with a version of the checkbox, and it's um, if you're doing research where uh, maybe what we just we sit around and we fight about, and we say, look, no uh, silicon-based computation system of this type is ever going to be conscious. I don't think that. I don't know if that's true, but maybe we say that. So, if you is this just silicon-based machine learning that gets checkbox doesn't go to the committee. Done. But yeah, we're gonna have to sit and fight about what exactly falls in the boundary of what these committees look at in f in full. Yeah. Can I just add to that that. Um, this isn't a special problem that would be to this kind of case. This comes up in IRB and human subjects research as well, right? There's the question of when you're interacting with human subjects in what ways or what other ways, when does it trigger in? And we do give some discretion to the, the researchers or the people doing it. But on the other hand, if, if, it's, if it's a border case or it's, it might be an over case and you don't do it, then there's a cost on the other end. So that's an incentive for the researchers to be honest about uh, when, when it's appropriate and when it's not. So I was curious, how, uh, how has buy-in, uh, how has the buy-in process been enacted for previous research oversight initiatives like IACUC? 
and how should and shouldn't that inform this? That's a, a really, really good question. So the buy-in process for IRBs and IACUCs has been mandated by law, um, which is nice because you get buy-in just by, by coercion. Uh, but that is not true for escrow committees. So escrow committees are a really interesting case. So the way, so escrow committees came about at sort of the, the foundation of embryonic stem cell research oversight, which was at the, during the second Bush presidency. And so there were gonna be no government regulations of this. The only government regulation was gonna be, we're not gonna federally fund any research on this. Um, Insert a joke here about how the good old days were when Bush was the conservative. Uh, and don't sue me if you're watching the live stream. Um, so escrow, the industry just got together. They said, hey, the public is concerned about embryonic stem cell research. We want to do this research in ways that's going to be acceptable to them as much as we can, but we want to reap the benefits. So industry and academia actually got together, collaborated, and set these standards and just opted to buy in. So I haven't studied that process enough to know like what kind of incentives there were, but there was massive buy-in because researchers really wanted to use stem cell lines that weren't approved by the government. So they were willing to get rid of the government funding to do this research, um, but they were sensitive to the ethical concerns. I don't know if AI researchers, I'm, I'm sure I'll hear about it, um, are as amenable to that, but the, es the escrow case is a nice case of that. So one of the bedrocks of human subjects research is informed consent. So I, I was wondering, you know, why you sort of didn't maybe touch on the idea of if we did actually end up having AI that's sufficiently similar to us, they might have moral status and then we might have to ask them for voluntary consent to participate in research. You let me know if you want to jump in, but I think that's right. So the, the ethical aim is treat subjects commensurate with their moral status. And so if the capacities end up being the ones that are just like ours, and we think we deserve informed consent as a constraint, then they're gonna get that too. And so that raises a problem that you might think that it's a bad idea to spend money on research where you might generate research subjects who won't approve and then you can't do the research anymore, <laughs> um, uh, which is a serious worry. Yeah. But it, it also speaks to the design and constraint issue that Eric and Mara were talking about, that if you are intent, if it is possible that you're going to create this kind of entity, you might also have to ensure that it's designed in a way that at that point it could give consent or it could be p possible for it to understand enough to give consent. Right, but what if it wants to? Right, well, then that's another question at that point, right? Then you'd have to release it, whatever that means, from the research. <laughs> and, 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 and that... Uh, and that's to the question of, of d does that mean you should not start down this research path in the first place or something? Yeah. Um, I have uh, a question about a certain PR issue that could arise. So um, what we have frequently seen, w including AI research, is that uh, good arguments get devolved into bad arguments. It's a certain instance of Gresham's law that seems to be going on. Uh, now, when applied to co-opting and coercing industry into doing AI research, how does one ensure that the argument that the justification industry uses actually corresponds with uh, being on track to creating a safe AI rather than some similar incentive which will, in the limit, still divert into horrible consequences? I mean, so we, we, I'll just say this, uh, I mean, we refer to, you know, to coercion a couple times by the power of the state is essentially what we were talking about, but there's other types of incentives. The embryonic stem cell case was an e example of a positive incentive. And so if you're talking about uh, industry, there might be positive incentives. I mean, there already are, industry is interested in doing this in a way that's not gonna cause problems with, you know, autonomous vehicles, so they're going to try to be proactive about that, right? So trying to head off these kinds of potential public relations problem could be an in, a positive incentive for instituting some kind of institutional oversight to prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, when we get to human li level AI, then probably they will also want to be AI researchers and do the research themselves. We the should, we, should, we, <laughs> should we put them as well as part of the committees? That's the question that comes up. Uh, <laughs> Ron gets, Ron gets excited about this question. Um, I, I, I don't know, one of the things I like about this, so like this relates to the question about informed consent. Um, we have these existing models of um, what the right way to treat human subjects are, but those are actual compromises on the basis of, hey, we're gonna do human subject research, let's sit around and form some policy about what's appropriate. And so this actually gives us a chance to sort of think about 
in a new way what commensurate treatment equals and how informed consent plays a role against other judgments. And I think that, that whether we should allow AI on and what role their consent is going to play is going to be a function of those discussions. So I don't want to prejudge it, but um, I don't see any problem with it. So the last time we gave this talk, someone suggested that um, Watson, there's already a version of Watson that's like a research intensive version of Watson. You put it on research committees to help you solve certain problems. And they asked about putting that. And I don't have any in principle objection to it, for sure. I appreciate that you've, uh, you know, you've fleshed out this idea that's been around for a while about whether or not there will ever be AI IRBs. Um, there's a few questions that come to mind. One is, you first of all, you've um, talked as if there are two different models, a compliance and an IRB model, but actually those are the same model in the way that they are instituted in the United States. Uh, the compliance officers prepare the people for the IRB and prepare the IRB for what the issues will be that they will have to make a decision on. But I think the more important question was alluded to by, uh, by Dave earlier, and that's really when does this kind of process kick in? Yours has presumed that we have a very advanced AI and therefore we get into these questions about informed consent or what its level of cognitive capabilities are and therefore um, whether it would be an appropriate subject and therefore or what level of, of rights it would have. But there's a prior question that, to that about when do we start getting to an area where sh we should even be concerned about that. So if we're going to hook up biological material to an AI, for example, in order to check out questions of emotions and pain, regardless of its cognitive status, if it can give pain responses, should we consider that something unethical to do, a priori, or might that be, as with animal pain, appropriate under certain circumstances? And then the other thing you alluded to a little bit earlier was, what about cognitive pain? Just on the compliance question, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, there's, there's a compliance component to the committee setup. Um, what we were had in mind is a strictly compliance model that are sometimes used in certain types of research labs with hazardous or materials or other things where you just have to, you don't have to go in front of a committee, you just check a list and then we inspect the lab to make sure the, the things are, so that, that was what that distinction was about. Yeah, and on the other point, uh, I'm not exactly sh sure how to answer the pain question, but like, when do we start evaluating this? If, if we're really so confident that current AI research and machine learning techniques are not going to raise any of these problems, then the cost to having that sent to a committee that, didn't just, sa that just says, here's why we don't think we should su be subject to evaluation, um, you read their reasons and say, okay, and then it, it's over. It, there doesn't seem to be that much of a cost to starting early. Um, especially, I mean, this, the thing is, whenever I go to give this talk or talk about this stuff, I do feel the silliness of it. Um, but at the same time, like Nick said yesterday, this stuff is going to seem silly, but then all of a sudden it's going to become controversial. And so I have that worry. And so if you trust what people in, that know about AI say, um, it just doesn't seem like it's that problematic or that sort of silly to say, hey, let's start thinking about this about current AI. Just have a researcher tell me why it doesn't matter that much or why I'm not likely to wor have ethical worries about this. I check a box and we're done. So the cost seems minimal to me to doing it broadly uh, 